Hey, what's up, guys? Hope you're having the best day of your life today. Today, we are going to do a problem called the block ramp frictional forces. And this is an example of a long free response. So a short answer paragraph type question that you're going to see on the AP Physics 1 exam. And this is going to deal with a block coming down some frictionless incline and then sliding to a stop way over here in 4D. They give us a couple of variables that they want us to work with. First, we're going to call the angle just theta initial. The lengths are going to be D, so that's essentially going to be the base of this right triangle right here. Then we have its release from rest. That's good information to know. Rough surface so that we know that there's going to be friction here, but there's going to be no friction here. And that's because they say negligible. Now, guys, in this course, negligible, we can just assume to be zero. They also give you a variable for the kinetic coefficient of friction right here that we're going to use as mu sub B. So the first question says on the axis below, and I'm going to scroll down, I'll give you those axes. They want us to label on the graph the following quantities. It's going to be the kinetic energy, and it's also going to be the gravitational potential energy from minus D way over here over to 4D. Calculations for the values and the vertical scale are not necessary, meaning on the y-axis we're not going to need to label numbers, but the same vertical axis should be used for both. So, And I'll show you what I mean by that in one second. So let's just scroll down and see what those axes look like. Okay, first let's look at the gravitational potential energy, which we know is going to be given over here by some height. So essentially at negative D, I'm going to have some amount of gravitational potential energy. As I slide down this incline, we know that mu G is going to be mg delta H. So gravity remains the same, the mass remains the same. So when delta H decreases, so does gravitational potential energy. Then when I get down to here and delta H is zero, I'm going to have no gravitational potential energy left. So my graph will look like this. It'll come straight down to zero right here. Now, guys, I've seen some students make the mistake. They want you to make sure that you also have to graph from zero all the way out to 4D. It asks you to do so. So you must make sure that you show that there is zero gravitational potential energy all the way out to 4D. Now, if you're using the same color as the axis, guys, just make it a little thicker. I mean, don't make a scribbly mess, but just make sure that you label this here. And they also wanted you to label the graph. So we say U, G. The other type of energy, as this thing goes down the incline, this gravitational potential energy on the incline is going to be converted into kinetic energy, where right at the bottom, its kinetic energy is going to be its maximum, and it's going to be the identical value of the gravitational potential energy to start. So at D, it had no kinetic energy, but then these switched. So that's what they say. You don't have to label values, but this needs to be on the same line here, and essentially, we're going to have a flip-flop. Now, what happens from zero out to 4D? Well, friction, the force of friction is going to do work. So work is equal to FD, and the friction force is going to be the thing doing the work here. So we know that the friction force is just mu FN. So this is going to be the work done by friction. And that's a linear relationship. So friction is going to eat energy in a linear fashion. So when this kinetic energy right here, it's going to start to slow down until it gets to a stop. And at that stop, kinetic energy would be zero. And that's what this graph will look like right here. And we must remember, we have to label this like they asked, kinetic energy. They did not ask for the quantity of work done by the non-conservative friction here. So this right here would be your final answer. All right, guys. So for the next part, for B sub I and sub double I, I'm going to put it on the same screen as C here because I'm going to use kind of both of these to relate to one another. But essentially what it's saying now is that I have a new ramp with a new base. And guys, just remember this. If I have a right triangle and this is theta initial, which is given, if I double the base to here, because of similar triangles, that's going to double the height as well. So if this is H, this is 2H. So by them saying that I have now 2D to come out here, I'm also saying that the height is going to double as well. And that's going to be very, very important. A student is asked to predict whether the final position of the block will be twice as far from than when it was released on the original ramp. So when I went on the original ramp, it slid out here to 4D. They're saying the student's saying, well, if I come from drop from up here, now it's going to go way out here to 8D. So the student reasons that since the block will be released from a new height, which is twice the height of the original height, the block will have more energy when it reaches the base of the ramp, so it'll slide further to the right surface before stopping at position 8D. So they want to know what, if anything, is correct about this statement, 
And if nothing is correct, just write none. Well, there are two things that are going to be correct here. So the student is right is saying that the new height will be 2H. Therefore, it will have more energy. And they're also right in saying that this new energy will make it slide to 8D. And for this one, with aspects of student reasoning which are incorrect, nothing is incorrect. So I'll just write nothing here because I'll save some space for part C. So this whole statement is actually correct. And essentially in part C, they just want you to prove it. So let's do so right now. So I know the sum of all the energies are going to have to be equal to zero. So I know that if I have some initial energy minus the work done by non-conservative forces, that must equal zero. So my initial energy equals any work done by non-conservative forces. Now, what supplied all the initial energy here? Well, that was the gravitational potential energy. And what was the non-conservative thing that did all the work? Well, that was going to be the work done by friction. So for our first initial condition, we can say that we had some m g delta h, and that's going to be equal to the work done. Now, guys, remember, side note, work is equal to force over some displacement, all right? And the force that's doing the work here is going to be the force of friction. So that's going to be equal to mu b fn times x, or in this case, it's going to be d. And mu b equal uh, mg, which is fn, right? Because we have a box that's on a horizontal surface, so we have the force of gravity, which is going to be equal and opposite to the force of the normal, times x. Students oftentimes will forget that x. So I'm going to write mu b mg x. This is going to be the work done by non-conservative friction. The beautiful thing here is mgs are going to go away, and I'm going to be left with delta h equals mu b x, and x is going to be equal to h over mu b. But now, how can I express h? Well, h is going to be the opposite, and I know also the adjacent, so I can deal with the tangent of that angle. So h is really just going to be d tan theta initial. And how far this went initially, we called 4d. So 4d equals d tan theta initial divided by mu b. If we cancel this out, we can make an expression that says tan theta initial divided by mu b equals 4. And I'm going to use this expression now when I double the height and the base of this triangle. I'm going to do the exact same thing again. I'll change the color so we don't get confused. Once again, the initial energy is going to be equal to the work done by non-conservative friction. So now we have mg2h is going to be equal to mu b mgx. Now, I'm not sure what this x is going to be, and that's kind of how I'm going to use this to relate it, but I know for sure that this h is going to be doubled. The mgs can go away. So now I'm left with 2h divided by mu b equals x. Now remember what I called h is d tan theta. So now I'm going to say 2d tan theta initial over mu b equals x. But what did I call tan theta over mu b? I called that 4. So now we have 2d times 4 from right here equals x. So our new x is going to be equal to 8d. That is the proof that when I double the height, I'm going to slide now to 8d. And I know students, there'll be some confusion how I substituted in the same exact h because they're going to say, well, wasn't it 2d and 2h now? Yeah, essentially in the second one, if I had 2h and 2d, you see I just divide both sides by 2 and that's how I get that same relationship of h equals d tan theta initial. And in part D, they want you to relate B1 and B2, the statements that you made, and if this supported that information. So for any correct aspects the students made, so here are the two correct aspects that the students made. How is the student's reasoning expressed by your mathematical relationship in part C? So we'll have a new height of 2H. We show that by the similar triangles here. 
It will have more energy. We show that it definitely has more energy. It's going to have two MGH at the bottom as opposed to just MGH. And the new energy will make it slide to 8D. We see that it went to D here in the first one, and then it doubled and went to 8D on that one. So that explanation of how you supported those, and you don't have to worry about um, B2 because there was no incorrect statements. And these same things show that there was no incorrect statements saying about students. Guys, I hope this solution helped. If it did, please give the video a thumbs up. If you have any other questions, leave them down in the comments below. Have a great day.